Rigor is the dimension of creativity that people often kick to the curb. Uh, people uh, sometimes think that that creativity is ah, doing whatever you feel like. And there's just like those anointed few, those artsy types who are creative. According to today's guest, creativity is an engine for innovation and business growth. Natalie Nixon is a creativity strategist, and while she researched for her book, The Creativity Leap, she interviewed over 50 people from different industries, and in doing so, she's been able to distill the art and science of creativity into frameworks that are going to be easy for anyone to implement in their businesses or in their workplaces. So if you've been feeling like you're in a slump and need help getting out of the weeds and looking at your business in a more creative way, this is going to be a great episode for you. Hi there, it's Sewa and welcome to another episode of the She's Off Script podcast where we help you create your own unique blueprint for business success. Before we dive into this episode, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss our next episode. All right, let's dive into it. So for anyone who hasn't come across you before, could you share who you are and what you do? Yes. Uh, so I guess who I am um, <laughs> is, um, gosh, I am, I am a woman who is constantly um, evolving. I am an entrepreneur. I'm a lifelong dancer. Um, I am a, a resident of Philadelphia, which is also the city where I was born and raised, but I, I have a real global perspective because I've lived and worked in five different countries. I'm African American. I am married and a stepmom. Um, and in terms of what I do, I am a creativity strategist and the founder of Figure Eight Thinking. And at Figure Eight Thinking, I advise leaders on transforming their businesses, uh, transforming them, themselves as leaders through the lenses of foresight wonder and rigor and as we get a little bit more into my work um the wonder rigor part is a theme the way i define creativity is that it's our ability to toggle between wonder and rigor to solve problems so that is what i do and and my mission in my work is to change lives with ideas mm, i love that and for you just kind of delving a little bit into your background after 16 years as a professor you decided to leave academia to focus on your company, Figure Eight Thinking, full time. Maybe you could share what you were going through at the time and what brought you to that crossroads where you had to make that decision. Yes, well, um, I was going through quite a bit. I, um, I, I was doing my my dream job. I, mm. I had, I had tinkered with the idea even as a college student that one day I might be a professor. My um, my actual professors in college, especially by the end of my senior thesis, they really encouraged me to continue on in the field of anthropology and to get my PhD in anthropology. And for a number of reasons, I decided not to, which I'm really glad that I did. And actually, when I was a professor, when undergraduate students would ask me for advice about their next steps, I actually really never um, support isn't the right word. I, I don't recommend that young people go straight from college to graduate school. I think it's so valuable to work and to think of your first few years of working as kind of your postgraduate education. But I, I through a, a series of circuitous events, I, I got an opportunity to become an assistant professor. And for the first 10 years of my academic career, I taught the business of fashion because my background in the fashion industry was as an entrepreneurial hat designer. And then I worked in global sourcing for a division of the limited brands, um, making bras and panties for the Victoria's Secret brand. I also had a master's degree in global textile marketing. Around year four of my academic career, on the encouragement of mentors, I decided to earn a PhD while working full time. And that PhD was in this field called design management. And I got so excited by the field, I said to leadership at the university, we should be doing something in this space. And as your listeners probably know, what often happens in large organizations, when you start raising your hand and say, we should be doing this, they turn around and say, great, you do it. So <laughs> that's what happened to me. And I did, I, I, I created and launched the strategic design MBA program. Um, around two years after, or maybe it was just a year after launching that program, I did a TEDx Philadelphia talk. 
saying in plain English what my PhD research was about, which was that the future of work is jazz, the most innovative organizations are improvisational. That talk led to a series of invitations by companies to come in and speak and facilitate and advise on how they could design more adaptive improvisational ways of working. And about six months into that, and all, meanwhile, I'm still a full-time professor. Mm -hmm. um, my husband, John said, babe, this is a thing, you should formalize it. And I said, kind of haphazardly, okay. So I created figure eight thinking. It was really a side hustle. It was really to be the repository of my practice. But I looked up a year later and realized, huh, I'm having a lot more fun with my side hustle. And this was in juxtaposition having launched this really cool executive MBA program that I was, it was my passion project. Um, I poured my heart into it. The challenge was I didn't have all of the financial and staffing support that I needed to really scale it. Mm. And meanwhile, I had this shiny object called figure eight thinking that was really starting to capture my attention. And while I can retrospectively say, oh yeah, so I decided to leave academia and build out figure eight thinking, at the time, as I was going through kind of this cognitive dissonance of, here's what I've always worked towards. This is my dream job. Um, my, my family is proud of me. I have status in the community. I have my ego involved. Mm -hmm. I worked so hard to get here, coupled with the reality that internally, my heart wasn't in it quite the same way and i was really being drawn to to this very different work and um through a series of creativity hacks that i did on myself that i actually now deploy through my course and through my advisory work i made the decision to leave academia to leave being an associate professor a founding director of a program after 16 years and to be honest, I have not looked back. It's It's been an incredible um, journey and an opportunity to, to make that leap and, and build my company. That's amazing to hear because so many people have probably been at that crossroads as well. And it's great hearing from you a few years past that point that you haven't looked back. And hopefully that gives someone the courage they need to, to make the leap wherever they are. Yeah, so it's been, I'm now in year five in building my company. And I would say that something that is important about making a leap, and, and my newest book is called The Creativity Leap. So I, I do a lot of thinking about what does it take to make a leap? Mm -hmm. um, when you listen carefully to a lot of people's stories about these sorts of transitions, um, a lot of the time they've been prototyping the idea, right? So and then my case, I, I certainly had been prototyping it. I was, I was through these short engagements that were, as I called them, my side hustle. I was learning slowly but surely what it is that I actually enjoy. Mm -hmm. What am I good at? What do people really need? Oh, it turns out I thought I would love X, but I really don't like it. And it turns out I'm really much better at Y. And you don't understand that until you test it. So for for those of your listeners who are at that precipice or at that crossroads it is um wise to to, to try to pilot and prototype in small ways mm. what you're thinking of doing because you'll be you will surprise yourself that you may love it even more than you thought or you may not love it as much as you thought yeah. or there's tweaks to it and so there's real value and and having that side hustle but then of course the challenge is really making that leap to fully engage in building that business mm -hmm. and once you've built that business it's also important to keep on growing and i know you've said that and i think there's a quote from you in a forbes article that there's a direct bold line that we can draw between creativity and business results. So as we start to draw that bold, that bold line during this conversation, um, maybe you could define creativity for us. You hinted at it at the start of the conversation, but maybe we can delve into that definition. Yes, yes, there is a, a solid bold line, not a fuzzy dotted line between mm. Uh, creativity and business ROI. And the way I think about creativity is that it's our ability to toggle between wonder and rigor to solve problems. And wonder is about audacity and big blue sky thinking and dreaming and daydreaming. Mm -hmm. It is incredibly audacious. Um, wonder is also about awe and it's about pausing. And because what I really like to remind people is that 
it's really hard to wonder when you're going 80 miles an hour. Yeah. So you have to slow down, you have to pause and you have to, you have to design both the time and the space for wonder. So our environment is very important for sparking wonder as well. Rigor is the dimension of creativity that people often kick to the curb. Uh, people uh, sometimes think that that creativity is ah, doing whatever you feel like. And there's just like those anointed few, those artsy types who are creative. Well, yeah. artists are exceptional at wrestling with the ambiguity of a creative process. Artists are exceptional at delving into both the wonder and the rigor. So rigor is about discipline, focus, time on task, mastery of skill. Rigor yeah. is not particularly sexy and it's often very solitary. And let's say you still are at this, you haven't read my book yet or listened to my book and you um, still think, oh, creativity is what artists do. Well, let's, let's go with that for a moment. If you yourself have done any sort of, of artistic practice, if at any point in your life you have studied or are studying dance or music or theater or something like that, you are well aware I'll take dance, for example, that before you get invited to, you know, do pirouettes across the stage or leap across the stage, uh, you have to spend a lot of time um, mastering the fundamentals. Mm. Uh, it's sweaty. It's gritty. It, gritty. It's not um, exciting all the time. Mm -hmm. It's very tedious. Um, but all, all of artistic study teaches us is that you is you have to know the rules in order to break the rules you have to know mm -hmm. the boundaries in order to stretch them and extend them and rebound against them you know the famous american dancer and choreographer twyla tharp famously wrote in her book the creative habit that before you can think out of the box you have to start with a box mm -hmm. and so that's the same uh for engineers for accountants for attorneys for teachers the best accountants lawyers physicians, farmers, plumbers are really good at this toggling between wonder and rigor to solve problems and show a lot of creativity in their work. Mm. I love that. You need to understand the fundamentals. You need to be strategic and disciplined enough to learn your craft before then you start being creative. Um, I think that's really where, from an entrepreneurship perspective, shiny, it, shiny object syndrome gets you because you haven't taken the time to get grounded. Yeah, well, and also the rigor dimension never ends in the creative process. Mm. You always have to revisit the fundamentals. You mm -hmm. always have to engage in rigor. If you are a writer, you don't feel like writing every single day, you know, yeah. but you have to have set up a discipline and a practice and different hacks for yourself. So you sit down and you do the work and it's mm. not always going to be stellar, but there'll be bits and pieces of that that will be helpful, useful down the line. But it's, it's, it's a practice. And yeah. yes, certainly for entrepreneurs, um, there's the wonder that comes from the um, content creation and mm. the ideation and the joy that comes from um, connecting to different strategic partners or, or, or clients and customers. Uh, the rigor is having systems in place, yeah. of having processes in place, of, of ensuring that you are really good at your craft or what at the thing that you're doing to help people for why they're paying you for these services and experiences and products. Um, so both are really important. Absolutely. Now I'm curious, how have you seen your clients transform their businesses through creativity? In other words, what has been the ROI for businesses who have been intentional about incorporating creativity into their processes? That's a great question. So my clients are come from a range of sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've I've advised clients in the technology sector, the legal sector, the nonprofit museum sectors, for example. And there are here's three ways that we can see the business ROI of creativity. One way is that when we commit to being more creative in our work, to toggling between wonder and rigor to solve problems. We have got to be more inventive in the way we approach, for example, our business models. So if we are committed to 
uh, not just the same old, same old that's been, that's been churning for the past 17 years, but to really be have a more inventive business model. When we decide to uh, disrupt, creatively disrupt our business model, that will lead to new and different strategic partnerships, which will lead to new activities and, and new sorts of resources that we have to cultivate. Mm -hmm. That leads fundamentally, ultimately, ideally to new revenue streams. So that inventive thinking takes us through the process of these new strategic partnerships and activities and resources, which leads to new revenue streams. That's a business impact, starting from inventive thinking to new revenue streams. Another example um, is that when we are more creative, uh, we, let me say it this way when we collaborate our creativity can really explode sure mm -hmm. sure we can be super creative when we spend the time to ourselves etc but it's in that stickiness of interactions with others who have different training different sets of skills different backgrounds mm -hmm. who, who show up asking very different questions or super naive questions from our perspective that help us to reframe so when we collaborate which most of us don't enjoy doing because we often think i could do this so much faster right. by myself why mm -hmm. do i have to work with these other people however it forces you to re-examine why do i do it this way not this other way. Um, that's interesting, their take on this. What if I apply that to the way I've been approaching this, this next product launch? What if I re-examine these former competitors and approach them to collaborate on something, right? So when we collaborate, um, that leads to uh, cognitive diversity, diversity of thought, and that opens us up to product diversi diversification, for example. That's um, a business impact. Um, and then finally, when we are more creative, a final example, um, we've got to be customer obsessed. You can't be obsessed by the thing that you sell. You can't be obsessed by this widget that you've worked on for years, or this app or this service, right? If it doesn't make sense for the people who you're trying to help with it. So mm -hmm. you've got to first start with the needs of the clients, the needs of the people who are buying your stuff. So when we become customer obsessed, that actually builds brand loyalty. When brand loyalty increases, that most of the time can lead to higher sales. Those are business impacts, right? So mm -hmm. those are the, that's what I mean when I say there's a solid bold line between being more creative, inventive thinking, collaborating more, being customer obsessed, and business impact with you know higher brand loyalty, increases in sales, um, greater efficiencies. And that, that, that was the other thing I wanted to say about collaboration. When we collaborate, we increase our productivity. And when productivity goes up, efficiencies go up. When mm -hmm. efficiencies go up, costs go down. Yep. And that's another example of a business impact. So now that we understand the importance of creativity in our businesses, what would you say are the biggest blocks or hindrances to people being creative? At least let's cover that before we dive into how we can be creative. That is such an important question. And the biggest inhibitors to being creative that I see in my work, it really, it comes down to our mental models. It comes down to our assumptions about who can be creative. One of the ways I help people op operationalize creativity and activate it is through a framework I, I developed called the three eyes. So it's not enough for me to say, okay, toggle between wonder and rigor to solve problems, off you go, you'll be creative. It's not as easy as that. Mm -hmm. How do you consistently do that? Well, the three eyes help you to do that. And it's through inquiry, improvisation, and intuition. So when, let's just talk about inquiry for a minute. One of the mental blocks, the mental models that people have um, is that we've been question shamed. I think all of us can point to a moment in our schooling, um, at a meeting for work, where we were brave enough to raise our hand, or we were enthusiastic enough to raise our hand and ask a question and either non-responsive, got shot down, um, we were embarrassed mm -hmm. and you get these implicit or overt messages to like, keep your questions to yourself. But here's the thing, inquiry and questions are fundamental to creativity. Mm. If we 
keep asking the same questions, we're going to keep getting the same output. And that kind of leads us back to collaboration. If you keep having the same people around the table with the same training, the same degrees, the same skill set, mm -hmm. they like to apply the same techniques, they come to the table asking the same sorts of questions. And questions are inputs into a system. So when we diversify the questions, we diversify the output. So one of the biggest inhibitors has been um, that we're actually not too good, most of us, at asking questions. And the, the good news is that's learned behavior. You can get better at asking questions. You can get braver at asking questions. Um, the other um, inhibitor to being more creative is the assumptions that some of us have about who are, who is creative. And if we stop at being artistically talented, because not all of us are artistically talented, that's mm -hmm. okay. That doesn't mean that that's where creativity ends, right? Especially if you have a more expansive view of creativity, that it's about this toggling between wonder and rigor to solve problems. Um, you don't have to be an artist to be creative. Artists are just exceptional at really exhibiting that ambiguous process. Um, so it's really a lot of that mental model work. Um, it also then transfers into our work environments where we cut off creativity at the knees. Some of us work in organizations where uh, they are the places where good ideas go to die. Oh, <laughs> <It's> gosh. <laughs> right? Where yeah. people are not very encouraging to questions. They are not, they're like, why will we change? It's, it's mm -hmm. like, fine. We've we're always done it this way. Yeah. We've the always old done heads. it this yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. So those are some of the, the, the major inhibitors that I see. Mm -hmm. And so you've already alluded to this. How can we then start to weave processes that encourage um, creativity into the fabric of our businesses, of our organizations? Well, one is to um, get better at asking questions. Uh, what, someone who I really admire in, in his work in asking questions is uh, Warren Berger, who wrote a great book called The Book of Beautiful Questions mm -hmm. that was followed up by another great book called um, Wait, no. The first book was A More Beautiful Question that was followed up with a book called The Book of Beautiful Questions. And Warren Berger, he made up his job title like I made up mine. I made up my job title of creativity strategist. He's a questionologist mm -hmm. and he insists that we actually should be teaching how to ask questions. But in our work environments, one of the things I advocate is that we begin to um, first learn that not all questions are created equally. So there's what I call a taxonomy of questions. There are divergent questions, questions like, like, I wonder why, what if, that help us to be more and more expansive. There are questions that literally, as you start to ask them, you feel yourself getting lighter. You have a physical reaction where you are feeling a bit more optimistic. You feel a mm -hmm. bit more dreamy, right? That's an, Pay attention to that. And then there are also convergent questions, questions that help us to get much more specific, Questions that help us to get tactical. So questions such as when, what, who, right? And then there are what I call hybrid questions, questions like how. How questions are both divergent and convergent because they're, they get into to, to process. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm a big advocate of, of redesigning meetings. And one of the ways we can redesign meetings is to experiment with having meetings that are just the agenda is just to generate questions. Now, don't get nervous. It doesn't mean that you have every single meeting that does that. Maybe it's a quarterly meeting. Mm. That's all you do. If that, if, if those are baby steps, or maybe it's once a month, right? It depends on the culture of your organization. And you can anonymously invite people to submit questions because um, people might feel uncomfortable having their name attached to a question. But you can literally have a meeting um, where the agenda is based on a question that's been submitted. You could have a meeting where the whole focus and purpose is to take people through what I call question storming. So you've heard of brainstorming. There's also mm -hmm. question storming. So that those are small, tiny shifts in the way people show up to work where you're already signaling that we're inviting a very much more expansive, generative way to approach um, our work. Mm. So we have gone through such a, I would say, massive shift in the way that we work as a society, just due to the pandemic and then due to just the domino effect of things that have happened as a result. Um, I know that 
in times of crises, that's when the most creative solutions are born. So given the work that you're doing, what do you see emerging as the future of work because of the creativity that has emerged during this time period? Well, you're absolutely right that uh, creativity loves constraints. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So getting back to my point that creativity is not doing whatever you feel like. Creativity loves constraints on your time, constraints on your pocketbook and money, constraints on people resources. Um, What I'm seeing in terms of the organizations, teams, companies that will flourish, not just subsist, but flourish and the future of work are the ones that realize that creativity is not a nice to have, it is a must have, especially because we're in the midst of a fourth industrial revolution where tech is ubiquitous. We are surrounded by uh, robotics, automation, AI, VR, AR. And in those situations, basic tasks will be taken over in a lot of work environments. These are, these are gonna, there are gonna be a lot of casualties in this fourth industrial revolution. The upside of that is that the organizations and companies that are smart will make more room for the human to show up. So um, I think it's very interesting, right? Where we're seeing um, already a lot of disruptors in the way to, to the sector of learning and education. So everything from Coursera, which has been here quite a bit, but it's also been um, an alternative way offering people to learn on their time and in their way. Masterclass took it a step further where they made it highly produced and sexy mm-hmm. and your your instructors didn't have to have a PhD, but they had street cred and they really had been in the trenches to, to hone their craft and they're beautifully produced in their micro units of learning. LinkedIn is in the learning business, fast companies in the learning business. So I'm seeing more already more um, kind of satellite opportunities for learning and eventually or companies are going to integrate learning into being able to retain the best talent. Um, the other thing that I saw even right in the middle of the pandemic was the emergence, which I thought, which I thought was super creative, of ghost kitchens, right? Yes. And ghost kitchens mm-hmm. are essentially um, had to happen in this moment where you had a disruptor of a pandemic where restaurants were not able to to open their brick and mortar doors they still had to survive so they took advantage they leveraged several things they leveraged um commissary kitchens where which are these collaborative commercial kitchens combined with the creativity of the chefs and their teams to design entirely new menus that were often short term where they were really prototyping new ideas for menus you wouldn't Mm -hmm. find that menu in the brick and mortar menu it was only for the delivery and that leads me to the third condition for for ghost kitchens, which was we needed the technology of delivery apps. Mm -hmm. So, but if you distill that, what's really happening, you have this combination of technology uh, being super adaptive and getting rid of assumptions about where the business has to take place. The assumption before was we're a restaurant, Right. We don't we're, we're a high end restaurant or we, we just do cakes or whatever it is. We've got to do it in this way. No, you don't. Who says you do? And in fact, now you can't because you have these constraints of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that type of adaptiveness of leveraging technology um, going to the customer, going to the client versus the client always having to come to the business. Mm-hmm. These are um, memes emblematic of what we'll see a lot more in the future of work. Well, Natalie, you've given us a lot of frameworks to think through as we are trying to become more creative leaders and business owners. So for anyone who would like to learn more about your frameworks and your, and your services, where can we find you and how can we support your growth? Well, thank you. First of all, for inviting me to share and thank you for asking. Um, people can just go to figure eight, thinking.com that's f i g u r e the number 8 thinking.com and sign up for the everwonder newsletter follow me on linkedin and on instagram where i'm nat w nixon and um there's a lot of content that i share uh, through my website there's a course called the wonder rigor lab um, i have a youtube channel so there's all sorts of ways to engage in the content just start with figureeightthinking.com and in fact uh, when you go to figureeightthinking.com, you'll see an opportunity to download a free sample chapter of my newest book, The Creativity Leap.
If you enjoyed my conversation with Natalie, I want you to know we have over 160 audio episodes you can binge listen to both on cheeseoffscript.com or anywhere else audio episodes are available. Before you head out, though, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss our next episode. All right, we'll see you right back here next time. Bye.